Good evening. As you know, we're going to be uh, in Romans 3, and I'm going to read a, a scripture that you heard twice, but we sort of have to start from that because there's an indictment that the Apostle Paul's bringing out. It's uh, verse 10, as it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. And that's the beginning of the indictment after it says we are all under sin. Lord, we thank you for everything. We ask that you come down in a very powerful way, that you meet with us. Lord, there are people carrying heavy burdens for different reasons. I pray that you will heal their heart or lift those burdens or bring perspective to set them free. I pray that they're, uh, uh, Lord, prepared to receive what you have for them today because you want to minister to them. And we just thank you that you are God, that you're in control, that you're reigning and ruling, and that nothing gets past you. And that, Lord, you're shaking, you're exposing, you're bringing things to the light so you can deal with them. And, Lord, we can, uh, we can get upset about, but we can praise you that you're bringing all things to the light, you're shaking all things, that you're going to bring forth what's necessary, necessary in order to bring forth healing and salvation. And we just thank you for that, and we just say this in your name. Amen. Now, one of the things that we need to remember is that Paul wrote Romans to a new church, and he did it in order to establish a very firm foundation under this church. He wanted to teach them personally, and because he couldn't get to them, he wrote this letter. This letter is so valuable because it does establish foundational beliefs that are so important to get right if you're going to get it right. And so Paul sounds like he's beaten different subjects to death. But again, you have to realize to build a foundation, you have to have um, precept, which is doctrine on top of doctrine, and truth upon the truth, lines of truth upon lines of truth. That's how you build a spiritual foundation. And so what happens in the building of the foundation is that you always have to go back to that point that you make sure you lined up to as you build that foundation. And so it sounds redundant, but it's not. Because he's approaching it from different angles. He's going to turn every stone over so there's not going to be any misunderstanding. The reason he does this is because I can say something to you. I can use a term like salvation. What does that mean to you? It means different things to different people. When what Paul is trying to do is that he is trying to bring us all into agreement about what's really being said about these different doctrines. He wants us to get it. And it comes out of repetition. And so he's approaching it from all different angles and you think, man, do we have to stay on this subject forever? I remember uh, a guy preaching on John 3.16. So he says, I'm going to preach on John 3.16. And I don't know how long he was a speaker at this church, but the next night he preached on John 3.16. And then the night after that he preached on John 3.16. And the night after that he preached on John 3.16. Pretty soon somebody came up and said, couldn't you change the subject? He says, when you guys finally get it, I'll change the subject. Paul wants us to get it. He wants us to get it. So he's always, he's approaching it from every debate, every argument, every angle he can, so we get it. What this is all about. Because so many people define Christianity on their own. And not according to the word of God. So he wanted the believers to understand what the Christian faith was all about. He wants you to understand it. He doesn't want you to go out there and find yourself unable to stand. Find yourself being twisted like a pretzel by these different arrogant cults, beliefs that are out there. And there's plenty out there. He wants you to know when you hear something, you have that foundation to test it by and you know that foundation is sure and true because it's been established over and over and you will automatically know if something's true or wrong 
You don't learn the counterfeit by dealing with counterfeits. You learn the counterfeit by dealing with what's real. And the church has to understand what is real. And so Paul has really uh, painstakingly, he's dealing with this issue that establishes our Christian faith, the foundation of it. Now, as you know, to lay the right foundation, uh, especially to our spiritual life, you have to begin with the personal work of Jesus Christ, which he did. The person of Jesus is he's God incarnate. And his work is redemption. You got to get it right. So he goes on to uh, talk about basically uh, the solution to the problem because there's a problem. And he, he presents that solution up front. It is Jesus. He's the solution. Now he's got to get you to the problem. What's the problem? Well, I already know it. Do you know that? Do you know how long it took me to understand sin? I understood it initially up front, but God had to take me down very far to really get me to understand I have a sin disposition. I have an inclination towards sin. I have a tendency to justify it, and I have to understand that because we individuals, if we tack enough self-righteousness on it, we can cover up any sin we want and believe we're okay. And so Paul is getting us down to you're not okay until it's been properly addressed. The solution, of course, is Christ. You have to realize we have to perceive things correctly. We have to hear things correctly. Uh, Jesus said, beware of what you hear. Because if I tell you something, and I've seen this, I've talked to people in cults. When I tell them something, I use certain terms, they change the meaning of it in their minds. And when we're talking, I'm talking to them, it means so, something so totally different than what I am meaning it to be. And this is the problem. So he is trying to really align our perceptions up so when we hear something we hear it correctly not through some filter whether it's doctrine or what we have been told but to hear it correctly and so to do that and this is what people don't understand is he has to practically tear up what you do understand in order to establish what you need to understand so you can perceive it properly. And he is, that's exactly what he's doing in Romans. He's trying to tear up the turf big time so you can understand it properly. Now, he wants us to be able to assimilate the word correctly. This is a problem today in a lot of Christians, they don't know how to assimilate the word properly. They don't know how to apply it correctly. They don't know how to walk it out. They don't know what it means because they have not been trained. They haven't been taught what it means. They haven't been taught what it means to walk it out properly. And, and the greatest teaching that, they, that the church has failed to address in walking something out is your attitude. If your attitude's not right, you're not going to walk it out. And so Paul is dealing with the attitude that we have about Christianity, about God, about life, and about the problem, which we'll get into. The problem, of course, is sin. God has provided a glorious solution. It's outlined in the gospel. Jesus Christ, he died for us. He was buried. He rose again. And there's so much to it. Paul's going to hit it from every angle. But you can't understand the problem unless it's in light of the solution. You're not going to understand how to deal with the problem unless you do it in light of the solution. They have to walk hand in hand. The solution is Christ. The problem is we've heard it, sin. Now, the thing that you have to understand is when you look at how Paul lays this out with sin, 
he begins with, please hear this, the symptoms of sin. The symptoms of sin. This is how sin manifests in your life. These are the symptoms of sin. Now, what is the importance of symptoms? Well, they say you have a problem. But the symptoms are not the problem. What you have people trying to do is deal with the symptoms and not with the problem. So I tell you, okay, you have symptoms, and you sort of suspect maybe those symptoms, and everybody hates this word, point to cancer. Our brother over there understands what I'm talking about. So are you going to treat the symptoms, or are you going to treat the cancer? This is what's happening in a lot of churches. They're treating the symptoms at best if they're doing anything about it. They're saying, okay, oh, up there, comply there, uh, perform there, act a certain way there, and therefore you're okay. And the problem is not being dealt with. And that's what we have. The problem is not an outward manifestation. It's an inward disposition. It's called sin. We actually have an inward disposition of sin. That means we have an inclination towards sin. We have a tendency to justify it. We have this, uh, this preference even towards it. It's called the disposition of sin. And we are born with this disposition. This is what people don't understand. They're busy out here trying to look religious. Perfect. And what's going on is in here. The disposition of sin has not been taken care of. It has not been addressed. It hasn't been brought to the foreground, or forefront, I should say. And it's still there. Now, we call this disposition of sin a lot of names. The old man is the most famous name. The old man in you. The unregenerate old man in you. And the unregenerate old man in you is selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed. It's all about me, myself, and I, and my way. We can go on right down the line. But that's your problem. And the more you give in to the old man, I don't care how much religion you put on him, he's a stench to God. And that old man has to be dealt with. On the cross, Jesus took away our sins. Now, Jesus was saying, the tree, a good tree can only produce good fruits. The bad tree can only produce bad fruits. What he's saying, based on your disposition, is going to determine the fruit you produce. So let's look at that. That's found in Matthew. So keep your fingers in Romans. I'm going to let Jesus' words talk instead of me. You hear me all the time. But let's look at what he says in Matthew 7. This is so important because this is a basic principle of the truth. 7. It says, we begin, by the way, in verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. It's that simple. The fruits of a person is going to tell you the real condition the quality of their inward man. It's there all the time. You can put religious garb garbs on it, but eventually that fruit's going to come out. And I don't know about you, I have seen these people look pretty good till I tasted their fruit. 
people, the fruit does not lie. Bad fruit cannot, will not come from a good tree. And good fruit will never come from a bad tree. And so we have this ability to know, even in ourselves, what kind of tree we are by the fruits in our life. And the fruit, basically, people, it's not the deeds you do, it's your attitude. It's your attitude, especially when you're being challenged and tested, your character is going to come out. That character represents the inward man. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Catch me on a bad day, you're going to see my human fruits. But the real test of my Christianity is not when I am just being my human self, it's when I'm being tested as a Christian as to how I'm going to handle crisis, how I'm going to respond to people, what my life is behind closed doors. I can be very human, but at the same time, that, that fruit of kindness or meekness can immediately come out and be there when you need ministry. Or it can come out and be there when you need to hear the truth and meekness, it's there. It's there. In spite of the humanness of myself. And that's how it works. It's always there. And Paul's trying to bring that out. So we look at the symptoms a lot of times. We stop at the symptoms rather than come back to the source of the problem. I'm not interested in your symptoms. Your symptoms are going to tell on me you got problems. When I ask the Lord to help me minister to people, I don't look at their symptoms. I look at their potential. What kind of tree can they be? And it's on their potential. I invest in them. And that's what we don't understand. I don't invest on people based on where they're at. I, based, I invest in people based on where they can be. No one makes an investment where something's at. They always make investments in light of where something can be in the end. That's true in anything. And that's true in the kingdom of God. I see your potential. I know your potential. I'm investing in you based on your potential. It's that simple. Now, people just say, straighten up your little wonderful uh, symptoms there and everything will be okay. We are too quick to let people get away with things. We're too quick to let them hold on to their attitudes. You know why? Because it takes time to invest. It takes time to challenge. And if I have to look at something and I have to face something that I am too tired or I don't want to deal with, we have a tendency to ignore it. And then it becomes a tidal wave. People, if there's a problem, you have to face it. Up front, you say, this is wrong. I'm not accepting it. I am not going to keep tasting this foul fruit anymore. Something has to be done. And so uh, we sell for a lot, for, for a lot less because sometimes we are just too tired or too whatever to make that investment, to stand to whatever we have to for the sake of that person. Now, people uh, treating symptoms instead of the source never addresses the real problem. Please hear me. Treating the symptoms instead of the real problem. I want you to understand that is the problem. That's what's happening today. We are treating symptoms and not the real problem. We are talking about symptoms rather than dealing with the real problem. We're not calling it out. We're not calling it out. And so Paul is calling it out. And, and so when people keep pointing out the symptoms, you know why? It's their means to judge, justify, ignore, and explain away the real problem. And sometimes we want to go along with that because we don't want to fight it out with people. So too many 
encourage believers to take care of the symptoms, the outward, while failing to identify and treat the, what makes those st uh, symptoms possible, and that is the problem itself. And I want you to know that's what leads to death. It's not your symptoms that lead to death. It's not the symptoms of cancer that's going to lead to death. It's cancer. It's not the symptom of sin that's going to lead you to death. It's sin itself. And we have to communicate that to people. And that's what uh, Mr. Paul was clearly trying to do. Because the more you, uh, you, you try to deal with the symptoms, the more the problem of sin escalates in a person's life. And then it gets out of control. So the problem is not just the sins, but that inward disposition we call sin. We are born in this state. It's a state where we are inclined to sin and have a tendency to justify it because we are simply sinners. That's what it comes down to. We all have the same problem. Oh, I'm worse than you. No, you have the same problem. We all do. That's why the Bible says, Beware of judging lest you be judged, because we all have the same problem. And I want to tell you something today. There's nothing that drives me more crazy than someone who's like me and becomes a mirror to me. And I've had a few mirrors out there. And, you know, when I, have, I come up to a person that's a mirror to me, you know what I do? I am so brave and wonderful. I look at Jeanette and say, you deal with them. You deal with them, Jeanette, because I could squeeze that person in the two, and that's not Christian, okay? That is just how it is. So we have, the, we're all in the same boat, we all have the same problem, and we have to address the disposition of sin in order to resolve the problem, okay? We have to deal with this to uh, do away with the symptoms, now, I'm saying all of this is because what Paul is beginning to describe in chapter, in verse 10, chapter 3, is your inward disposition, what it looks like to God. It doesn't matter what you think or what I think, it's how God looks at the inward disposition. He sent his son to die for you, so that this inward disposition can be addressed. That's the problem. Man doesn't want to accept what has to happen. What has to happen, of course, is to have a different disposition, we have to be born again. That's why the Bible said, Jesus says, you must be born again. You must have a new heart and a new spirit, because guess what? The other one is a disaster and a train wreck ready to happen. So that's the bottom line. So this is what he's talking about in verses 10 all the way through 18 is this disposition of sin in us. What it looks like, how it responds, how it, how it uh, uh, basically looks at things. He's talking about it. So that's why you have sins over here, the symptoms. He talks about the symptom of sin in Romans chapter 1. We read all about that beginning in verse 29. But over here in chapter 3, he's saying this is what the disposition looks like. This is what this inward fallen man looks like. This is how he responds. This is how he acts without the intervention of being born again. So that's what we're getting down to. Now, one of the things you have to realize is that, again, the message seems redundant, but it's not. It's not. He's approaching the symptoms first. Now he's, a, he's approaching the inward disposition of sin. It's not redundant. Now, Paul was stripping away the lies as we look at and the foolishness that surrounds the subject of sin. Now, not only does the word lay out that we are all understand, because we are, 
But unless Jesus intervenes, we are all doomed and under the wrath of sin as well. The death of sin. And so this is a big issue that Paul wants to deal with. Now, not only is Paul laying out that we're all under sin, but he, he gives us examples. And basically, we don't need a lot of examples. We have them all around us. Look at how corrupt people are. Look how our families are falling apart. Look how lawless society is. That's because of this disposition of sin. It's not because somebody has an identity crisis and thinks there's some gender out there from outer space. It's not because uh, of this or that. It's because of the disposition of sin that's in them. It can easily be taken away by attractions and affections. That's why the Bible tells us to set our affections on above. Beware of the attractions because our lust are quick to be caught up with it. We can easily fall into the traps. And the Bible is always trying to warn us of these traps. Now, what you have to understand, and verse 10 brought it out, is because of this inward disposition, we are all under sin, and as a result, nothing righteous can come from it. Nothing that can please God, nothing that can honor God, nothing that he can count as righteous comes from that old disposition in us. We call it the flesh at times, however you want to call it. But nothing good can come from it. It doesn't matter how good you're trying to be, it's unacceptable to God. You may be the most decent person, you may not have murdered or killed anybody, but you're still in this fallen disposition, and whatever comes from it is not good. God cannot accept it. He's holy. And that's what he's saying here. And then he goes on, because nothing good, nothing righteous comes from this, it says man doesn't understand. Man cannot understand who God is. Man is unable to interact with God to understand him. Because God is spiritual, we're fleshly. And we're in this fallen condition that is totally contrary to God. That's what it's talking about here. It says no one understands. Look at there. There is none that understands. That's verse 11. There is none that seeketh after God. If I can't understand who God is, I can't seek after him. People are seeking in all these arenas to find God, but if I don't really understand who God's serve is, then I'm not going to know where to look for him. I know to look for him here. But what am I looking for? And if you can't understand God, you don't know what you're looking for. Because there has to be that understanding of who he is. And this is a problem that a lot of people are having. They want God, but it's on their terms. They want to put God in some box according to their understanding. And what God is saying, if you're coming from the flesh, the old man, you're never going to understand me. You're never going to understand me, and you're not going to be able to find me, no matter how much you seek me, because you don't know what you're looking for. Now, we're bound by an earthly perspective. We're limited by the world, okay, without any spiritual insight from the Holy Spirit when we're in this fallen condition. We lack that inability, that ability, I should say, to understand God. If we can't understand God, please understand me, we're blinded. We can't seek after him. We're spiritually blinded. So we're in a real predicament, aren't we? And yet how many people see the predicament and really run to God and say, you know what, I'm the biggest loser there is. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Break me and thousands of pieces if you need to. But I need to be brought down to nothing so you can have your way in my life. 
And you have to sometimes get there. Because our premise is very worldly, very fleshly, and we're operating from a sinful disposition, there's no way we're ever really going to have that spiritual understanding until we're born again. Until we're born again. That's why you have to be born again. It's for this reason that man seeks God in every arena but the right one. And we talked about that last week. Now I want you to look at verse 12 with me. We're going to there's, there's uh, three points that are brought out in verse 12. We're going to look at all of them. They are all gone out of the way. There's number one. They are all together become unprofitable. There's number two. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Number three. There are three indictments in that verse alone. It shows you the inward disposition of a fallen man. First of all, let's look at the first one. This is so important. They are all gone out of the way. Now, I want you to think about that. The reason man's ways, they've gone out of the way, they have gone out of the way of life, truth, salvation, hope. There's only one way, that's Jesus. There's only one way to truth, that's Jesus. There's only one way to life, that's Jesus. There's only one way to hope, that's Jesus. They have gone out of the way of what? Righteousness. They have gone out of the way of salvation. They have gone out of the way. They have basically uh, come to that place we call the broad path of destruction. Now here's the problem man has. Man doesn't, see, doesn't start out to do it wrong. But you see man is always starting from the wrong premise. A wrong understanding, a wrong motive. It's about me. They start from the wrong premise. Now, please hear me. If you start from the wrong premise, you're not going to end up right. May I just say that? So they start from a wrong premise, and they say, well, you know what? Uh, it's got to be right, because I didn't start out to do wrong. How many of you got up in the morning and said, I'm going to do wrong? OK? We have the best intentions, but we're still starting from the wrong premise. So I want you to go, I'm going to prove this to you. I want you to go to Proverbs with me. Most of you have marked Proverbs, and it's going to begin with 14. This is how God, we have, you know, I learned this as a new Christian. Never did quite understand it until I realized this. It's 14, 12. 14, 12. I want you to notice what it says. There is a way, notice the word way there, which seemeth right, it seems right, unto a man. And notice what it says. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Now how many of you learned that, right? Now keep your hand because we're going to, uh, but we're going to go to Proverbs 16, which is just over a couple of pages in your book. There's a similar saying, only there's a little difference because the one ends in, I want you to notice 1412 14, ends in death, but in 1625, it also ends in death. One says destruction though, eventually, but it says in 25, which confirms it, there is a way that what seemeth right unto a man, but the end there are, are the ways of death or destruction, however you want to look at it. So a man can say, my way is right. It still ends in death because he's coming from that which is fallen 
what we call the old man, the unregenerate nature, however disposition, however you want to look at. Now, I want you to go back up to 16.2 in Proverbs because he says something that's very important. Proverbs 16.2. All the ways, notice what it says, all the ways of man are what? Clean in his own eyes. It comes back to the fact that we start out with what we think are the best intentions. We don't want to cause any problems. So we start out clean in our own eyes. But notice what he says. But the Lord weighs your spirit or your motives. Why are you doing it? Because our motivation comes back to the old man. This is where it tells us in three how we can make sure we keep ourselves on the narrow path of righteousness. It says, commit thy works unto the Lord and not thy thoughts. Notice what it says. Thy thoughts shall be established. In other words, if I say I'm going to line up to God's way of doing it, I'm going to do it his way, then guess what? Your thoughts are going to be established in that. Not the other way around. It's called obedience. It's called having the faith to do right. And then my thoughts are established correctly. Because I thought I start out in the wrong thinking. Now, we have to remember God's ways are higher according to Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. But let's go to Hebrews chapter 3 because it says something else. Hebrews chapter 3, keep your fingers in Romans. It's just a good exercise here, right? Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 3. Now, Hebrews chapter 3 is talking about the, the, the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness. But it says some very important points here that's for our benefit. We are going to begin in verse 10 in chapter 3. It says, Wherefore... I was grieved with that generation and said, now I want you to notice what is being said. They do always err in their heart. They always err in their heart. This is 3.10 in Hebrews. They err in their heart. Why do they err in their heart? This is so important. You've got to see this. They err in their heart and they have not known my ways. They erred in their heart because they did not know the ways of God. God doesn't step outside of his ways of doing things, people. He does it the same way. In every situation, he's consistent. Do you know the ways of God? The ways of God are righteous. They're righteous ways. The path is righteous. And so they were erring in their heart because they didn't really care to understand the ways of God. Now, I want you to go down to verse 13 in that same chapter. But exhort one another daily. This is saying, you know, stir up, wake up. Exhort one another daily what is called today. Lest any of you, notice what it says, lest any of you be hardened by what? The, through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin has a tremendous deception level. If you're in sin, it deceives you. It tells you you're okay. That God will understand, however, but sin has a tremendous deception level, and the first person it blinds is you. And the more you get into sin, the more your heart becomes hardened towards the truth. So when people go to you and say, you've got a problem here, at first you may be open, but when you resist dealing with the real problem, your heart becomes hard towards the truth. And you get harder and harder. And there are times that God has 
Uh, I, and it's in scripture, I don't know where it is, he says, don't tell them anymore because the more you tell them, the more they harden their heart and the more I have to judge them. It gets very serious. So, Isaiah 53, 6, you don't have to look this up, but it tells us. Now, notice what it says. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. That means we've gone our own way. We have turned everyone to his own way. That word own is important. And the Lord has laid on who? Well, he's talking about Jesus, the iniquities of us all. You see, iniquity is a matter of what's inside of us, what we really want to do. And it's often contrary to God. We want our own way, and we're trying to figure out how to get it around God and get it without getting in trouble. It's moral deviation. So let's go back to Romans now. When you get back to Romans... We're going to look at Romans 8, which is a couple chapters over there. There's something in Romans 8, 36, which Paul talks about. And that famous four words are at the beginning of it, which means it's also in this. He got this from the Old Testament. It's just not uh, something that's new. It says, as it is written... This is verse 36. For thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now he's talking about how as believers, we are often offered up daily for the sake of others. But you have to realize that the sheep oftentimes are going their own way. And don't be surprised if they turn around and trample you under when you try to challenge them. Now, Jesus, of course, is the only way. He's the only way to truth and life. He's the narrow way. Uh, he's the sole way. He's the only way you're going to get saved. His way is hard because it tells the way of the cross. You've got to deny yourself and pick up the cross daily. We can only come to life by way of Jesus. It's a blessed, wonderful revelation of the shedding of his blood that bought us today. It's called redemption. So that we could have life. He took our place on the cross to address the symptoms of our sin and to begin to address the old man in each of us. But I'm, just, I'm going to tell you something I've learned. The cross of Christ deals with my sins. But it's my personal cross that deals with me. Applying my personal cross daily. The disciplines of the Christian life is what deals with the inner man in me. I have to apply that cross daily. I have to deny myself. I have to give up my rights to myself, just as Jesus did on the cross, in order to deal with the old man and me. The Bible talks about mortify the flesh. Mortify the old man in you. Paul says, I die daily to this old man in me. Because it wants to raise up its head, people. I know, I have it, I face it every day at different times. I want to punch the lights out. We have this big battle sometimes. It's called the uh, flesh warring against the spirit. All this stuff we call a lot of things. I just want to punch its lights out. I always say to Jesus, and I always tell uh, Jeanette, well, Jeanette has said it sometimes, really, sometimes I just want to run away from myself. Because the battle can get so intense, intense. But know that if the cross is applied, you deny yourself, the cross is applied. That discipline comes into your life. Remember, commit your ways. Commit your ways to the cross, to the work of the cross. And what will he do? He will line up your thoughts. 
So the next one is we have become unprofitable. Think about that. The Greek meaning of this word, the Greek meaning, the Hebrew has a different name, word, meaning. The Greek meaning means vain and worthless. In, er, in other words, everything that comes from the old man in you, that unregenerate disposition is unprofitable. It benefits no one. It is in vain, it's useless, and God has no place for it. It doesn't do a thing for him. It doesn't do anything for anybody. There's no eternal value to it is what it comes down to. It's because we're not righteous. It's because we're unable to understand spiritual matters and seek God in his holiness. As a result, man has gone out of the way of what is true and right. As a result, all that man does in the flesh based on his old man, is vain. All he does according to the world is worthless. And all he does in line with Satan stands judged and doomed. That's the bottom line. That's why everything that comes from the old man has no profit to it. Now, this is very interesting. The Hebrew word for this is I was a little surprised when I found out what it was. It's filthy. It's filthy. Everything that comes from the flesh is considered 100% filthy to God. Now, if we could take on that attitude, it would change how we would look at our best, what we think our best is, and realize that God is filthy. It's a stench to him. There's nothing that he can do with it. Every and anything that originates with the flesh, the world, and Satan is considered filthy to God. Now this may seem like a tough word, but we need to realize that all matters would always be filthy in light of the holiness of God. That's how holy he is. Now, this would naturally follow it. Everything's unprofitable. Here's the third one in this sentence. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So what is good? Now, there's an order to this. He's showing you the base. It's unrighteous. He's showing you because you can't understand, you can't see God that there's no way that you're going to understand what it really means to do what's right, to do what's acceptable, to do what's profitable. There is nothing good in it. Now, good has different meanings to it, depending on where you read it. When you go back to Genesis chapter 1, and God is creating everything. He says, good. That word in there means it is delightful. It is, it is enjoyable. It's something that he can enjoy and show his grace in. Because it was a perfect environment, the garden. So it was good. So for that, it's very, he said that after man was created, it was very good. Now, in Matthew 19, 16, where the rich young ruler comes seeking eternal life, he calls him good master. Jesus made a very important statement in Matthew, um, let me get this right, 19, 16. He says, why call me good master, for only God is good. Now, that seems like a contradiction. Some people say, well, he's saying he's not God there. No. He's, he's forcing this man to have clarity because he's asking him if I am good why are you calling me master because only God's good you see there's an important term here master means teacher now I can teach you information but you don't have to receive it 
Okay, or you can receive it and not do anything with it. But if he's truly good, then he's not a master, he's God. And if he is good and he's God, then that man has a responsibility to obey because he's God. And so it's almost uh, a dichotomy, the, 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 the two terms together. That's what Jesus is saying. You can't use these two terms together because they conflict with one another. I am either God or I'm mere master, but I can't be both. Because if I'm going to speak to you, it's not a matter of teaching you. It's a matter of you need to do this if you want to receive, receive eternal life. And so he's, he's clarifying it in the man's mind. Who do you really say I am? Master or God? That's what he's saying to him in so many words. You can't use the two, two terms together. And so... Uh, Perhaps this man was going through the back door, in a way. He was acknowledging who Jesus was because he was seeking eternal life. But please hear this. There is no back door approach to God. He's either God or he's not. And Jesus wasn't going to let him get away with that. And so that's why he's calling him. He's not. He's saying, am I just teacher and overseer and man? Or am I... God. Now, in this verse, good means beneficial. Everything God does is beneficial. It's lasting. It's eternal. It's beneficial. Now, as a teacher, Jesus, if he was a mere teacher, he could not benefit him in that way. He couldn't benefit him with eternal life. But as God, he could. But this man had to respond to him in such a way to benefit from him. So good is beneficial here. He wants to benefit your life spiritually by giving you eternal life. Now, here we come to the meaning of good here in, in Romans 3.12. The meaning of good here is different. It is one of excellence, is what it points to. No one can do that which is excellent because of our condition. No one can do that which is excellent. This excellence is associated with character, moral, upright character. And what he is saying is she, a man in his fallen condition will vo be void of this moral, upright character that will ensure excellence in their life. That's what it comes down to. No one, no not one, is good. They're not excellent in character. They're not morally upright. Well, that's quite an indictment, and that's true if you are operating in the old man. There's nothing excellent in the old man. There's nothing morally upright in the old man. You may have morals, but you're not morally upright before God. And that's what he's saying. In our sinful condition, there is no pure moral character present. When are we going to accept it? I had sort of a moral life growing up. But inside I knew I was immoral. I knew it because of how I thought. I knew I was immoral. Jesus brought immorality right down to what we think and look at. He told, uh, 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 he told in, of course, the Sermon on the Mount, if a man lusts after a woman, he has committed adultery. He lacks that moral uprightness, that excellence of character. Now, the disposition, we have to allow the disposition of Christ to be worked in us. That is, that is bottom line. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit begins to work this disposition of Christ in you. Do you know that disposition is described 
in Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 8. Now, I didn't tell you that one, but if you want to, it's not far from Romans. You'll find Galatians, Ephesians, and guess what? After that's Philippians. But this is what the attitude of Christ looked like. This is the moral goodness of Christ in an excellent manner because of his attitude. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort and love, and any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded. Like-minded is an important word. Having the same love, being in one accord of one mind. He's talking about attitude. Let nothing, this is important. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In other words, consider it. Let this mind, it's telling you right now, this is the, what the mind of Christ looked like in his humanity. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That was his attitude. The Holy Spirit wants to work that attitude in you and me. And as you can see, no one can establish any righteousness outside of Christ. No one has any means to understand or relate to God outside of Christ. Man remains lost and has no means to seek him outside of Christ. Man has gone out of the way of truth, and as a result, he is unable to bring any profit to God and his kingdom outside of Christ. He has no means to benefit God outside of Christ. Benefit his kingdom outside of Christ. Now Paul is not done with exposing this fallen disposition in us and how it translates into our life. He's clear. He wants you to have an understanding of this inward disposition that we have all been born in. What he wants you to understand is it's not hopeless. That you can be transformed in the renewing of your mind by the Holy Spirit once you're born again. Once you receive the promise of life and the provision of his spirit.